Just to get, kind of give you a sense of what's going to happen here, uh, we're waiting right now on a, on a laptop that we can connect to the internet for. This presentation is for your benefit as well as my benefit. And what I'm about to give you today is a glimpse and an opportunity toward seeing what the future is going to be, okay? Now, in order to get a little sense of looking at the future, it's useful occasionally to look at the past as an example. Uh, does anybody in the room not have an electronic mail address? Okay. Has anybody in the room not surfed the web? Oh, good. Okay. We are in a, st a situation right now inside the United States and in the, in the world very similar to uh, a time when I wasn't even in college. Okay. It was, it's kind of like the, the Robin Williams has a joke that if you remember Woodstock, you were never there, as an example. And unfortunately, I left back at my office um, a very critical historic viewfoil. I had, I had one view graph, which is why we had this view graph machine here. Uh, this presentation does not involve PowerPoint. Uh, the one view graph that I have, which is small enough, I, I, you know, I could literally reproduce it here. But I wanted to show it to you because it was the original historic view graph, which in 1969, Bob Kahn, if you've ever heard that name, gave a presentation at the Pentagon and said, gentlemen, this is the ARPANET. And this was the beginning of the internet as we knew it at the time. It consisted of four computers. Uh, interestingly enough, the first three were in California. The fourth was in Utah. Uh, Bob Kahn has certain opinions about the nature of California being a good fertile ground for all this as well too. In 1969, just think back to yourself where you were in 1969. I was in ninth grade. And uh, I wasn't even in college. But about four years later, when I started undergraduate uh, en education in uh, nuke engineering, and I decided to get out of that at that, at that time, are we going to have a? Oh, great. Um, I, I had, by chance, selected this particular school here, UC Santa Barbara, just down the coast, for my education. I decided to become a math major. I had a, I had a math professor, literally, I was a freshman walking down a hall thinking about becoming a math major. Steve Simons, a professor of mathematics, literally leaned his chair back out the hall and said, as he's poking out the door, hey kid, do you want a free computer account? This is the era of punch cards. And um, the rest is kind of history. My time on this machine, for those of you on the far side, my time on this computer here changed my life. This is the second most important computer experience to me in my life. The first most important having a few years later, but well, that's a different story. Um, have any of you seen the public broadcasting series history called Nerds 2.0.1? Some of you, one of you, one or two of you have. By the way, this view graph is in that, is in that program. And they interview Bob Kahn in the program as well too. And he and Len Kleinrock talk about the establishment of this first link right here. And they talk about the interface message processors and the protocol, because the network protocol, or the, the network control program, as an example. The beauty of this, there, there's several things that you might or might not be aware about this, this configuration, this topology, which actually kind of reflects on um, the United States and democracy and like. One thing to do is no, note something here. Here's your graph theory. This is not a hierarchical directed graph in any way, shape, or form, okay? Um, don't mistake this one node here simply because they made a link to Utah as the, 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 the root of a, of a hierarchy. Uh, for those of you who have had some, a little bit of experience with networks, one of the things that you have heard about is when some of these links would go down, for instance, the network would still continue running. I recently had some Russian visitors come by and they never got this. They were still oriented by sort of a centralized um, method of, of, of handling resources and the like. But there's another thing that's very interesting too here that you probably don't realize nearly as much is that in the earlier days of computing, computers were really different. I mean, they were really different. Uh, there were originally here, th these first two machines were Xerox machines, not the kinds of Xerox machines that you know today. There was a company that Xerox Corporation bought Here's an IBM machine, an old batch mainframe. I stuck punch cards into this machine. But fortunately, hanging out kind of late at night, I, I discovered the ARPANET here. 
And by the time I got it, four years later, there were about 20 machines on this network. And uh, one of the things that I would do is, from my machine here, is I would play chess with a machine at MIT in, in Boston, 3,000 miles away, as an example. And it was a different kind of machine. After I grew tired of playing chess, because the chess program's up there, I'm a crummy chess player, when I started to um, log on to these remote machines, this is before email, by the way, one of the things that happened was I learned about this little program called FTP, or File Transfer Program. Not quite there. Not quite there, okay. We only want a web browser, that's all I need. Netscape or, or Explorer, doesn't matter. Um, I started moving Fortran programs around for interesting things to move around. And one of the things I learned automatically was uh, if you use any programming language, you know how you use the assignment statement, the equal operator as an example. I would bring some programs to my IBM machine here. And you know something? Rather than have an equal sign, there was another character. It was a pound sign. And I learned about, I learned about character sets that hard way. And my thought at the time was, um, boy, these other people on this remote machine, they're really stupid. They, they had this other character there. And it's like, you know, unfortunately, better, for, for better or worse, the character set on this machine actually was the wrong character set really to really be working on. Uh, I was working at Epsodic, ASCII. You I learned about computer architecture from this experience. It is this diversity and, and heterogeneity which makes the internet a very special thing. And in fact, this has interesting repercussions for things like computer security as an example, because it turns out that a lot of security only takes place because of the fact that you have heterogeneous machines. It's a very simple thing to be able to say, make a blanket, blanket statement. It'll be really easy if we have all these machines be the same type. But if you have them all be the same type, then you, be, you, you introduce common vulnerabilities that if you can get into one machine, you can more easily get into others and, and vice versa. It's a trade-off that, you, that you'll kind of see. You might not under, believe this or not, but actually you are at the same stage that I was when I began my freshman year. Four years into the ARPANET's history, I got on. Digital libraries, the Digital Library Initiative has existed for about four or five years right now, too. And it's a ground floor opportunity. Why is this important? Well, uh, are, we, are we getting close yet? No, it's Internet Explorer is dying. How about uh, Netscape? <laughs> what? Stock price. But you need internet access, right? Right. Do you have everything set up? Or do you have a net card on that? Are there y any young <laughs> aspiring hackers here in the audience? <laughs> That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll keep talking while they get this all squared away. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go back to older technology. But see, here's, here's the problem. I, I, I can no longer tell you about digital libraries. It's, it's too big. I'm going to give you a URL now. If, 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 you, if you sleep for the rest of this, for this presentation, Remember, remember this URL because it, it may be the most significant URL that you will need for the rest of your life. Okay, and that's this, www.dli2.nsf.gov. Okay, the, the Digital Library Initiative is the federal government's decision to put its research dollars for the future of information technology. What I'm basically going to tell you about is the successor to the successor of the ARPANET. We're two generations of federal initiative removed. About six years ago, uh, there were a bunch of bureaucrats sitting in Washington, D.C. trying to figure out where they should put money 
into research for the United States. We've had an ongoing problem with regards to the funding of science and technology. Um, of course, the web was, was less than two years in existence, okay? The people from, from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency were kind of smug because they had this nice network going on. It was becoming a very, very successful thing, okay? You've all sampled this, the follow-on to this network. The more protocols and experience you have on this, the successor to this network, the more you'll understand how this network runs. As a minimum, the easiest thing for you to use, of course, you've all used experienced electronic mail. Probably all of you have surfed the web. A few of you probably have also transferred files. You've used FTP. Okay, FT FTP was actually for me uh, the beginnings of the most of the most one of the most important programs that I learned. Turns out, just to let you know, FTP in 1973 is no different than FTP today in terms of its syntax. They've added a few commands, but you know, all you do is you're moving files around. The, the second most important program I had access to at the time, because we didn't have electronic mail, there actually was a time in computers without electronic mail, was Telnet or our login. It basically, it's the ability to have a remote login on a distant computer, as an example. And uh, there are all kinds of questions about sending data and whatnot like that, which I won't get into, okay? But anyways, what happened was everybody wanted buy-in. Okay, they all, they all wanted to have access to this, to this wonderful thing. So anyways, the people inside Washington, D.C. were trying to figure out, well, how could we leverage the federal dollars that we have to do research on what will be the next great thing? In 1974, the, the big thing that people thought about was a little program which the National Science Foundation had funded at the University of Illinois Supercomputer Center called Mosaic. Some of you may have remembered or heard, heard of Mosaic. Andreessen and one of his colleagues, of course, left the University of Illinois and they went off to found Netscape. Hope this works. <laughs> um, okay, so what I need to be able to show you with this is first is to give you an idea of, of this URL here, okay? So, Basically, three federal agencies got together. The National Science Foundation was designated by the National Coordinating Office of the White House to, to lead the, the latest federal initiative on digital libraries, okay? And uh, DARPA came along, so we have DARPA's buy-in. Now, for you in the defense community, one of the links I was gonna show you was, was going to be sponsors. We'll do that in a second, okay? And your representative, the person that represents you for the Defense Department is Dr. Gene Schultz. Uh, I forget how she, she specifically does her name. The thing is, all you need to do is simply go to this web page and then look for the sponsors, okay? Now, why are we interested in talking to you? Why, why should you be interested in us? Well, because of this. When you, look, when you look at, when you use your web browser today, what do most of you type in or else use by default? You use HTTP, okay? It's these P's, these protocols. And what the Digital Library Initiative is doing actually is developing new protocols. You don't want to get com too comfortable thinking that HTTP is the only end all and be all. There are, there are a slew of other things which go in to that window which are being developed right now. One thing you, you want to try to understand about the, the, the internet as it existed back 30 years ago and as it exists now is the internet is largely a text-oriented media. Sure, you can pull over a few GIF images or JPEGs, and I'm, so, I'm sure some of you have played with Photoshop and things like that, but it turns out that the internet as, ex as it exists right now is not very good for things like streaming video, uh, audio, and geographic information systems, for those of you who have to do you know, mission planning and the like. And you might think, well, you know, I can pull over things like that to a degree right now. The problem is that the internet is not really optimized to, to do that kind of thing. Like for instance, one of the things you probably can't do right now, and you realize, and this is actually an artificial intelligence problem, of course, is um, how do you search for a particular image, as an example? It's a tough computer vision problem. How do you search for particular, say, targets from a remotely sensed image? And radar images, for instance, 
have different characteristics than IR images versus um, visual and the like. Okay. The, the purpose of the Digital Library Initiative is a whole bunch of federal agencies getting together, pooling their money, and having people do research in these off-topic areas in order to get things like chance. Like, for instance, how do you search on a video stream? Suppose you only want to hear a particular quote as an example. You have a three-hour long documentary, like the Nerds documentary as an example, and you, you're looking for a particular quote. You don't, want to, you don't want to go and find out that it's at two hours and 49 minutes, do you? Okay, so it turns out there are, there are, there's research underway to do these kinds of things. So back in 1994, the federal government with th our three agencies, the NSF, DARPA, and NASA, to the tune of a million dollars, um, well, I should say, we all contribute, our, our, our respective agencies contributed various amounts of money, but we funded six universities in the United States. Um, the six universities, just as an aside, were Stanford, Berkeley, turns out my old alma mater, Santa Barbara, University of Illinois, uh, Michigan, and Carnegie Mellon University. So if you attended any of those universities, as an example, uh, you, ha you have a potential conflict of interest, as an example. So anyways, um, they, f they did research on what it meant to put various large amounts of data on the internet. And uh, they produced some papers. And they produced a few pieces of software. Um, probably, if, if you use search engines on the web, the digital libraries phase one um, entity that you've probably heard of most is a search engine now in Mount, based in Mountain View called Google. We funded Google. And the SF is very proud that, you know, it's a very nice search engine. It uses some very nice... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh. For not, well, it's not part of this, but... Uh, G-O-O Google.com. Um, this is a Stanford graduate student who didn't, didn't finish his PhD to go off and make tons of venture capital money and stealing graduate students and professor, his professors from other digital library funded universities. But uh, Google, Google right now in many respects is probably the most powerful search engine on the, uh, on the internet. If you have complaints too, let me know. I talk to Larry about it all the time. But, um, okay, so that's Digital Libraries 1. It, it ran for four years. It funded six universities, basically a million dollars a piece. Now, what's, what was significant about it? Well, it turns out when the Phase 1 Digital Library Initiative happened, one of the things they asked for is, well, we would like you institutions to cost share. And that, what that meant was, for every federal dollar we provide you as a project, we want you to find one matching dollar in research. And to a professor, actually, a million dollars a year is a lot of money. Uh, graduate students, you know, go for about $50,000 a year or so, plus or minus. Um, you know, various other schools, there'll be larger amounts of money, less, less, more or greater. Well, typically a professor is lucky to get one matching dollar to every uh, initial dollar. The awarded universities got two to three dollars. There was more interest in digital libraries outside the federal government than inside the federal government. They came from four basic areas. Um, first and foremost, of course, were the computer companies. Now, uh, let me jump ahead to the obvious conclusion. We had six universities, right, that we funded in phase one. We had six universities. Two of them were partnered with the Microsoft Corporation at the beginning of the initiative. Care to guess how many were partnered with the Microsoft Corporation? At the, by the end of the phase one? Six. Not quite six, five. Okay, so yes, Bill Gates has his hand in everything. Oh, and the, and the other obvious question too, by the way, is will Mr. Gore take credit for this? The answer is yes, this is Mr. Gore's initiative. Okay, I mean, he, he actually is kind of the father of digital libraries in, in many respects. He, and this is before he was vice president as well too, okay? So, you know, Bob, even Bob Kahn says this as well. Okay, so anyways, What's happened? Phase one lasted um, four years. You probably didn't hear too much about it except for Google. Um, you'll be able to see this as soon as we hopefully get this all running. Trust me, it's magic. So phase two of digital libraries. You, there's a link, by the way. You'll see, you'll see there's a link up at the top of this for phase, for phase one, okay? 
For phase two, we're running a different situation. We have m additional buy-in. In addition to the three original funding agencies, we've been asked to be joined by the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. So for instance, those of you who have medical interests, um, this is very important to you because formats for things like x-rays and the like are going to be very important. The Library of Congress is involved. The National Endowment for the Humanities is involved. The National Archives and Records Administration, the Smithsonian, and the FBI. Not the FBI for security, but the FBI has an incredible information management problem internally and they're hoping digital libraries is going to solve that. Okay? They're really tearing their hair out having to simply maintain information. So anyways, you'll see the list of funding agencies when you go to this website. Trust me, right? Um, we have basically three, we had hoped for three classes of projects. This is something you won't find. So say, oh, we have a Netscape window. We're getting there. I trust you. <laughs> um, we have basically three classes of projects in digital libraries, one. Okay. We were hoping to have one large project. What's a large project from the Washington DC point of view? We were hoping to have one project to last five years and 50, 50 million dollars, excuse me, five million dollars, different, different number of zeros, five million dollars at this level. Well, we didn't get it. We were hoping somebody would propose a very ambitious digital library project. We were hoping to have three or four million dollar projects, roughly the same size as we previously had. And then we were hoping to have a whole bunch of, let's see, these are, these are four to five year duration. This is five year. This is big, medium. And then we were hoping to have a whole bunch of small projects. What's a small project? One to three years and uh, roughly $200,000 a year. Okay. What could you do for research? Anything. It, it, this is a chance to do fundamental basic research in digital libraries. Are we okay? We can't get the server. We can't get the server. Yeah, yeah slightly, but no, no quizzes in the audience to fix all this and get, get, to, get us to our rescue. No? Okay, well, we're just going to have to go proceed without it. Okay. Anyways, we have a couple dozen projects here, all right? Now, if you look on the web page, just to let you know, the way the web page is organized, I know, I know, <laughs> bear with me. Um, there will be a link up here toward the top, which will, which will refer to phase one. Yeah, no, I, I realize. Um, in fact, let me do that. Yeah, you're right. I should do so. You are here. This is the organization of the web page. Okay, so there's a, there's a phase one link. If, if one of the six schools I mentioned happened to be your alma mater, if you know somebody went, you know, you, you can go to phase one. But it's relatively boring academic stuff. Most of this, in fact, is boring academic stuff. You have, to, you have to take your imagination with the ARPANET like I showed you as an example and realize this is, this is the same thing. We're in the Kitty Hawk era of digital libraries. We're trying to figure out what these things are. There will be a section here for sponsors. Okay. And for those of you who are in positions of power or you know, move on to positions of power, you want to talk to Dr. Jean Schultz. Okay. She is your DARPA representative. Okay. Why would you want to talk to her? Well, if you're looking perhaps for funding or maybe a an interesting data set or you have something that's of interest to you. Okay. Over here though, on the left the leftmost column, though are the the main is the main link that you want to look at. That's funded projects. Okay. And what you want to do is you want to, you want to take this link on funded projects and you can see who has been awarded. And they, they include a wide variety, excuse me, of institutions, not all biased in California, by the way, uh, but a fair number. And they include places like Stanford, Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Santa Barbara, down the coast. But also there's now a project in Oregon, project in Washington, project in Columbia, a couple of projects in Boston, and the like. 
Now, in addition to these funded projects, these are the ones that I work with. There are also some separate funded projects for undergraduate education, which are in here as well too. And there's also a link over here, up high. Uh, this is more for the people who kind of run the initiative. Uh, it turns out we're having a meeting in about two, two months. Um, and the reason why digital libraries, one of the reasons why digital libraries are so, so important is in addition to this buy-in that people have, you know, where every federal dollar is matched by two to three um, other dollars. Oh, sorry. You guys, you guys have to keep me on track. I forgot to tell you the, I forgot to tell you the four categories of, of um, people who funded matching money. First were the computer companies, right? And you can guess all the, name all the computer companies, right? And most of them are players. Second are the telecommunications companies. They want to buy in as well too. AT&T, um, satellite business systems and so forth like that. The third group of people who are interested in digital libraries are the publishers. And it turns out I am a journal editor. I am an associate editor for John Wiley and Sons, the oldest and largest textbook publisher in the United States. And as part of digital libraries, I went to Manhattan, New York City. Can't stand big cities myself. But um, John Wiley has a 36-story building there, which all the textbooks you have ever purchased, published by John Wiley and Sons, that's where your money goes, OK? And as you probably are aware, as you take technology classes, one of the things you realize is about, about the nature of technology, this, the pace of change moves very fast. When John Wiley and Sons buys a printing press for their factory in New Jersey, which prints off textbooks, they expect a printing pre press to last 70 years. That's an interesting uh, contrast to our field with Moore's Law and basically the doubling of uh, device density on, on chips in 18 months, give it two years even, okay. Oh, what's, and what's the fourth after the, after, after the publishers? It's a, it's a miscellaneous set of other concerns. State governments like the state of California has an interest. Uh, other federal agencies like the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, they're, they're, they're partners for instance with my alma mater, UC Santa Barbara. Um, nonprofit institutions like the Getty Museum and so forth, these are all related to digital libraries. Again, look, look at the sponsors page. And if you look at some of the funded projects, you follow these funded projects and they'll have links to their industrial partners, okay? And if there's some particular professor or some particular organization that you wanna work with, that's where you'll find these links. You'll have, to, you'll have to do a bit of digging. But let me get back to this last bullet here. Why, why, why talk to you guys? Why talk, why talk about this? and the like. Well, Monterey is uniquely situated because of the Defense Language Institute. One of the things which came out very early, not just here, but also came out in discussions with, with regard to the development of Google, it turns out the second biggest concern beyond merely getting things running is a very strong requirement for multilingual language support. Knowing a second language is an, a, of an immense importance. It turns out more than half of the interest in the funding of digital libraries is outside the United States. Uh, first and foremost are the English speaking countries, but also very important are the non-English speaking countries. As you'll notice, for instance, I'm not in a typical European ethnic, ethnic mix, but it turns out we're having our first uh, all projects meeting. We, we, we get all the projects together every few months or so. It turns out we're having our first all projects meeting in England. And the way it works is this. Um, the United States government talks with a foreign government, in this case England, and they have, of course, an institution which funds research in England. And what we do is we, we basically agree on what each side will do. No, tr no money has to transfer across national borders, but what you do is you partner an English university with an American university. Both governments give each of the universities at the same time, and in theory, the two universities work with each other and develop uh, research together, okay? We have six English US university pairs that we're funding and you can follow the links on this website to those. We've also signed an agreement with the German government and we have two pairs of US and German universities who are being funded. We're also funding other universities throughout the rest of the European Union as a, as a contiguous entity as opposed to, you know, these individual countries. 
that's in the Western Europe area. There's a lot of interest in digital libraries in New Zealand, in Australia, where the distances are, are long, but also in also Hong Kong and mainland China. They have great interest in digital libraries and understanding the Chinese character set and understanding the Japanese character set, of course, are, are, are very, very important. Um, I work with agencies in the intelligence community, and I can assure you that the NSA has a lot of interest in, in Chinese characters. Okay. And uh, it, these are very, very important things. So, so digital libraries promises to be a big thing. In addition, by the way, to the, the development of new protocols, you should also consider the following. Uh, there's also going to be the development of new formats. Have any of you noticed the change from, as, as, as the net has gone, looking at the end of file extents going from .html to .htm as an example. Okay. Who, who would like to make a venture a guess as to why we're seeing more of that as an example? Come on, you all know the answer. You said it before. I heard it. No, Microsoft. <laughs> right, okay. This is an artifact, this is an artifact of people going to three character extents, okay? Some of you probably have heard of XML. A few of you may have heard of SGML as an example. Yes, those are coming along and those are going to be in influential to digital libraries as well too. I can assure you that there are going to be other formats coming along and your awareness of this digital library initiative is er essentially early buy-in to understanding what some of these new formats are going to be. Formats for video, for audio, for geographic information systems, for all kinds of other things. Digital Libraries Phase 2 attracted 500 proposals in the United States. We funded approximately uh, 30 of them, I believe, so far. I'm flying back to DC next week. In fact, we're going to be evaluating more. We're trying to decide you know, who, who gets what money, what limited money the federal government has that it's available to funding research. But anyways, this is a very, very brief overview toward, toward digital libraries. Um, I've left a whole bunch of, of, of stuff out because actually this is now for your, more for your benefit to explain more of this. First off, for every one of you who filled out a 1040, this is what your tax dollars are going to in terms of basic, the funding of basic research. This is not to create infrastructure. There will not be a single integrated digital library at the end of all this. This is to understand how to ask the question and understand what the nature of the problems of storing large amounts of information on the internet are going to be. This is a ground floor opportunity. I've kind of given my own experiences with the ARPANET as an example. We're now in this phase. People are now beginning to understand what the, what the nature of some of these problems are. What I recommend you do, for instance, as, as an example, is you know, visit the, this web page, find one of the funded projects, um, find the, uh, a link to a web page for the project. You might look at one or two of the papers, or you might try some of the test bed demos and things like that. Like, for instance, the Carnegie Mellon project, unfortunately, is one of the projects you can't run over the internet, actually. But they talk about the research. It's called the Informedia project. And the idea behind the Informedia project is <coughs> Carnegie Mellon has a vast experience on speech recognition. And what they do is they can take streaming video and run a speech recognizer and create a virtual script from that. You create ASCII text. Now, it's not perfect. But once you have ASCII text, then what can you do? Well, with time indexing, you can search. You can search for something that somebody said. You can search for Chiron. Chiron's a word that I learned taking on this assignment. Chiron is the text you see at the bottom of uh, a television, as an example. It's like a person's label or their title or whatever. It's not closed captioning. Okay? That's only for the people who have the decoders for closed captioning. Chiron is what everybody sees. Well, you can run you can run image recognition tech, uh, technology on that and search based on Chiron as an example. And when you do this, the advantage you get is that all of a sudden, what seems like a linear media, which might take a long time to go through, like for instance a videotape, one of the jokes is you could see Gone with the Wind in, in seven minutes or something like that. Uh, that's 
you know, part of what you need to be able to do sometimes in order to make fast decisions. And you want to be able to find information very quickly. Because, you know, what's the problem now? Everybody right now, it's a big problem is you're deluged with data and there's a lack of, of, of real information. Okay, so this is what I recommend, you know, go visit this website. I couldn't do it today. Previous, in previous digital library phase one presentations, I could describe to you what the six projects did. Makes no sense doing it now. First off, you guys can surf on your own time. You'll find the stuff to, to be your own uh, benefit and value. Uh, you know, you get a, an opportunity to get a ground floor opportunity like I did when I was um, a, young, a young freshman. And you can see potentially where internet futures are going to go. Uh, I know a lot of people, it's like, when is, when is Google going to do an IPO as an example? I wish I knew. Uh, but I know that their chefs, they, they, have, they have two chefs uh, are holding up for stock options rather than getting paid. So, um, so that's a quick overview of the digital library initiative phase two. Are there, are there any questions? This is your time. And uh, you know, we love to have your involvement as well too. It's your time for initiative. No questions. It was the lack of the demo. What makes Google different? That's a good question. Um, most search engines, what they do, of course, is they take a web page and uh, bring it into the machine for processing is based on largely syntactic search. You're simply grepping for particular words, and you have pointers back to the web page. The problem with that, of course, is you take words out of context. So the real challenge is to how to find context. And before Google, what most people tended to do was the information retrieval, it's the semantic search kinds of things, and you get into the problems of how our words define. Google avoids all that. What Google does is it searches a web page for links, and then it begins to tally links both to and, and, and from a given web page, as an example. And then one of the things they figure out is when, as people get better and better information on web pages, they put links back to the, to the good information pages. And so consequently, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a human screening mechanism indirectly used to find good web pages. That's what it is. It, so it basically looks at links point, pointing to uh, relatively good information sources. Now, you can see obvious problems with that, but that didn't stop them from doing forming a company. Okay. They're, they're working on, on those problems that you could think of off the top of your head. So that's what makes Google, right now at least, currently the king of search engines by doing uh, link analysis. And uh, I'll also let you know the intelligence community, of course, is doing things like this as well, too. So, Other questions? You say something about relevance to the military in the library. Um, well, the, the best person, of course, to talk to is, is, is Gene Schultz. Um, there, are several, there are several areas that, that, that come in. First and foremost is training. This is, this is probably the biggest headache that, um, I, I mean, I wish you guys well. The DOD, when you, when you, when you have commands and the like, um, you know, it's going to be training. Man, the, the technology is changing so fast is the big problem. So as all of you have had exposure to web pages and the like, the, these, these web browsers are going to become your, your primary interface to training. So well, one of the other things is, You'll probably see new protocols to help out with education and the like to be able to try to maybe um, somebody will come along and ask a question in a different way than they had, somebody had previously thought. So capturing that kind of information, that, that, that data, is, is going to be really important to training. Uh, the web browsers are used extensively in the intelligence community as well, too. One of the big problems is an analyst in one area and by the way, just as an aside, I don't have a security clearance. I refuse to get one. But I go, but I go, visit, I go visit the NSA and the CIA all the time. And we kind of communicate with things. And they, they visit us. But the thing is, an analyst will be over here, will know something that an analyst over here doesn't know. And the problem is with, com with, with, with compartmentalization, how do people get to communicating? And it turned out that the whole multi-level security thing actually worked against analysts being able to exchange information like that. Uh, it turns out there's a book about the classified internet called um, Intel Link. And you, you can buy the book at Amazon. And it comes actually with a CD. And one of the things it had to do with actually there are, there are classified news groups 
inside, inside the intelligence community. And they, they thought about trying to do news groups with multi-level security. And they couldn't do it. It's just, just too much work. There are too many implications. So they said, look, you're on your own. It's an honor system. Don't violate, don't violate any sort of, but you know, and it turns out to be, it turned out to be more productive that way. So what they're hoping to do in the intelligence community is go more and more to web-based kinds of, kinds of use of uh, information. There are some security, you know, just regular security issues about, you know, how, how can you trust a particular web page. Uh, there are issues having to do with e-commerce. One of the things I didn't mention here is that some of the projects we fund to do e-commerce work, right now, for instance, when you go to a library, your taxes, your local taxes go to pay for books in the library and like that model is not working out very well. Um, some people say we'll use the blockbuster video concept of information handling as well too. Um, you know, most people have uh, rental agreement cards with uh, VHS, you know, blockbuster video basically. You know, it, it's just convenient to, convenient to use and so that's that's something that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're funding as well too. Carnegie Mellon actually has, a, has, a, has an electronic payment research project as well too. What isn't working about the library system? Well, the problem with the library system right now is the library system is based on handling paper, which is the obvious thing. And if you start dealing with um, certain large amounts of data, it increasingly gets harder and harder when you have to when you have to go over larger and larger amounts of data. You're relying more on on the human smarts of librarians and other people to tacitly know where to find pieces of information, and that's not necessarily a, a, a good thing. One of the things that attracts a lot of people is our ability with computers, of course, to search gobs and gobs of text very fast and, get, and getting it into in, into a machine readable form. But the problem is that the economic system for publishing in the United States is not set up to, to handle that model. There is less and less incentive to, to publish on con conventional media. Uh, and it's particularly bad in communities, technical communities like physics and computer science because it's just simply easier to put up a web page. Uh, you sort of skip peer review to a certain degree, although Google kind of handles some of that implicitly. And so consequently, you have publishers like John Wiley and Sons. Not only, not only does John Wiley print off your textbooks that you buy, but it prints off 300 journals, of which I'm an associate editor for one of them. And one of the things you might notice is the cost of journals is skyrocketing. My journal, which is only a quarterly, although it's refereed by very good men, um, is now $300 a year. And who's going to pay that? And the, the, incentive, the incentive is not there. So there are a number of ideas like, for instance, a subscription model. Is sub subscription going to work? And the answer so far appears to be no. Not nearly that many people are willing to pay for it. A big part of the problem is your time. Your time and your attention. I mean, I realize how much, you know, if you, if you did even some multiple of the minimum wage, I'm taking up a lot of your time. But hopefully I'm giving you value by pointing to your future here, at least part of your future. So uh, the question is how can the publishing model... Electronic subscriptions won't work either? Yeah, electronic subscriptions. And this is one of the reasons why you have so much spam and junk mail. Uh, because so people... Pay for use, where you pay for each individual use? That's, that's, that's the blockbuster video model. People are trying that. It's still, that's still a version of subscription though, mind you. Okay, people are trying that and it's a so-so success. The only thing that's working so far is advertising. And that's why we have so much junk, junk electronic mail, junk websites. And it turns out that they're figuring out just the right volume. You know, you're looking at a web page, for instance, and something comes across, say, for Amazon.com, as an example, and it does it at the right time. And they get enough of a margin to sustain that. Advertising is the only thing so far that has been shown to work on the internet. And so these are some of the things people are studying. Yes? Um, I'm the director of the library, by the way, so I have a sure. variety of interests in what you're saying. Um, one observation I have is that not only is the economic models of publishing a concern, but to us in the library field, the storage of this data is of very, That's right. very importance. Um, and the question 
question of who's going to be responsible for, in fact, maintaining files of electronic information is something that I, I don't see the publishers really practicing very well. I know Stanford and several other places have. Highwire Press, yes. To, to start addressing. They, that's a spin off of our project, yes. Um, the observation I would like to make is that one of the things that struck me today about the, your description of the digital library projects is the um, disparateness of it. That's right. It appears that you're taking and funding um, whatever appears attractive and interesting. That's right. Um, and I know that what strikes me is that that is both a model that has been used in the provision of libraries and library service in the United States and worked very well over the past several hundred years. Um, but is it a model that is in fact going to answer the primary questions in the development of digital libraries? I mean, there's questions of storage, there's questions of, of retrieval, there's questions of search engines and all of this. And is there any attempt to really take that 500 projects and, and identify key questions in each of those? Or how are the selections going? Well, um, the selections are amazing. Well, a couple things to characterize this initiative. This is an initiative out of the agencies and the parts of those agencies which fund computer science research. And so it's not a library science initiative, as you were clearly aware. There's not a lot of money so far in library science. So what's happening is you're probably seeing at Berkeley, Michigan, the library science schools are now turning to schools of information, whatever that means fully. This initiative is set up in order to do basic research to simply be a magnet to attract people who want the opportunity to get some federal money to fund interesting ideas. And it's fully peer reviewed. People in the community make evaluations on what they read in their proposal. And there are many decent proposals out there. We can only fund uh, a, a small number of them. You know, it's, you know, it was 500 proposals. It was not 500 projects, actually. Uh, it, it was, you know, we're lucky to fund maybe 10%. And what we're hoping to do is spark other people, other industries to contribute money to also do this research as well too. Because as you all are aware, there was a time when computer science departments did not exist. And bootstrapping computer science departments were interesting political exercises in the late 60s through the, through the 70s and, and, and even in the early 80s. There's still schools, for instance, right now looking for computer science faculty, literally begging simply because there's more money to be made in venture capital and, and, and foreign off ideas. There are, we do have projects which are looking at repositories, which are looking at um, other issues, you know, not merely search and, and, and the like. But it's largely up to the proposer of a project to set the course of information. We merely govern uh, where the taxpayers' money go to what we regard as our, our best decision as to where we think uh, funding should take place. So, you know, unfortunately, for this phase of the initiative, almost all of the projects have been awarded. We have one more award coming out soon. We didn't attempt to uh, award all the projects at once like we did in the first phase. Uh, and so there's a little bit I can't talk to you about in, in, in some detail because we haven't, we haven't announced those particular awards yet. But you know, each of the funders has their own sort of input. Like one of the things most of you probably aren't aware of, unless you've dealt with the medical community else, doctors have a completely different view of information than anybody else has. And that's both good and bad because of things that, it's, it's not merely doctor-patient confidentiality. See, that's a privacy issue. And we fund a, we fund a project on trusted medical systems up at, up at Stanford as well too. And that's going to have repercussions elsewhere for your privacy, your medical records, and things like that. And how, how these things get around. Uh, you need to be able to get them to ambulances, for instance, in the field. Ambulances are, are, are a horrendous environment to do computer science in, as an example. But they're trying, as an example. Um, mobile computing is very big. How would you, how would you like having uh, a digital library at your fingertips anywhere you go? One of the reasons, for instance, I wear these pants is for 
as I can, I can store my technology in these cargo pockets, as an example. For voice, you know, I have voice recognition hardware here and, uh, you know, smart ID cards and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's an easy way to carry this stuff around, actually. It's very important. Are there other questions? Cynthia. Um, I think some of the students may need to go to another class. But yeah. You need to oh. For security, um, also for, for, for history's sake, as we brought this little device here. How many of you have seen the movie U571? Okay. Well, this is, a, this, this, is, this is one of the reasons why we have computers here. It's not on the camera, unfortunately. This is an Enigma machine. This is a three-rotor Enigma. For those of you who are familiar with the, uh, the crypt algorithm, uh, and it works, by the way. Uh, I have as a eight-time responsibility is we have a thing called the Computer Museum which is based on the one in Boston. And it turns out that the founder of the Computer Museum, Dr. Gwen Bell, whose husband Gordon Bell is the designer of the VAX and the PDP-11, um, they, they acquired one of these machines. Um, here are the uh, infamous rotors, which you might have heard about or not. Here's three rotors here. Uh, people think, tend to think these are, tend to be kind of rare. Actually, the, 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 the Nazis made between 100 and 200,000 of these. And in fact, um, the United States Army, and I believe the Navy, had, had purchased one of these in 1928. Also, two, it said, thank you very much, but you know, we're, not so, we're not so interested in that. Uh, it's, it's amusing to me, I, I learned in the, in the John Walker spy case that uh, one of the things that Walker did was, uh, that I, I guess rotors are still actually used in the cryptographic devices uh, to, today, used aboard fleet ballistic missile submarines. But it turns out that uh, um, the rotors that are used in the current device use 36 36 pads, these only have 26, okay? And you can kind of get an idea of the correspondence for some of these things. You're welcome to come down and actually play with this. We were playing with a, with a message earlier on. But, um, you know, as you go through your trials, remember us with regards to the Computer Museum. It's going to be up at Moffett Field. We used to be a Navy base. Uh, I work for the NASA part of it now. Uh, we have a small Navy contingent still. But um, this is just, like I said, a little bit of history here that I, I, I kind of brought along since we were talking about security and digital libraries somewhat. There we go. And uh, it works. So if you want to come down, you, we, you, know, you, you can send each other a coded message or two on it. But this is, you know, this, is not, this is not a naval enigma like they show in the movie. But it does work. So anyways, I'd like to thank you very much. And if you have a specific interest, come down. I can give you business cards. And we can talk, we can talk further. Thank you for having me.